Hi, everyone. Um, I hope that I managed to keep you awake. Um, it's been a very long day. Uh, my name is Diogo, and I've, I've been working for the past few years with uh, Professor Freitas and uh, Luis Hayes and Pedro Costa, who I'm sure you have met. This is all ongoing work, and it's on very high psychophotic testing and multi axophotic testing. So I'm going to give a very brief introduction to the topic, because I, I'm not sure there are here PhD students or anyone else who has, uh, is not as familiar uh, with the topic as other topics have, have been presented here. So basically, very high cycle fatigue, we're talking about obviously 10 billion cycles, 10 to the, to the power of nine cycles or, or more. We know there is no inf such thing as infinite life. Um, and um, also um, about predictability of material properties. So um, we have um, uh, new uh, metal alloys, which are um, metal additive manufactured alloys. And we have an isotropy, and it is important that we get uh, predictability of properties um, in a quickly manner from an industrial point of view. And this is just uh, one example coming from a, a magazine in the UK, which is a professional engineer, uh, where you can see that many parts in, in, in even turbo propellers have been replaced by 3D printed uh, components already. Uh, the problem is qualification of these products. So to achieve or to be able to do very high psychophotic testing, we're talking about having to change our test um, procedures. And for that, the technique um, that is now becoming quite common is ultrasonic fatigue testing. And if we compare uh, to uh, achieve 10 to the power of nine cycles um, at 20 kilohertz, we would talk in theory about half a day uh, of testing. This is not true because the, the the specimens hit up quite a lot, so it's probably around about four days for a test to be completed. But if we would be using rotating bending at 30 hertz and uh, applying simple math with a machine operating 24 seven, that would take us to one year um, uh, of testing for a single specimen. Uh, so the principles behind are based on um, resonance phenomenon. We basically have uh, that the specimen and all the components in the machine, which involve an actuator, um, a booster and a horn, they are all vibrating as if they are in free, free conditions, um, in, in the axial um, conditions. And that's the picture we can see here extracted from ANSYS. Uh, so the other um, aspect of the research is about biaxial testing. So the amazing thing about ultrasonic fatigue testing is versatility. So we've seen before and in this session um, uh, multi-axial cruciform specimens for in-plane uh, fatigue testing um, in the case of plane stress. Machines can be quite complicated and cumbersome in a way, but if we use ultrasonic fatigue testing and based on the knowledge of uh, mode shapes, uh, we can actually get a lot of flexibility in the types of stresses we can obtain. We can even get, um, we call here, I call it CT, this is not compact tension, it is, it is uh, for me it's easier, it was because it is compression tension, so if this arm is going in the inwards direction, so if you have compression on this end, you have tension, so this is in phase, uh, sorry, out of phase or pure shear type of specimen. In this case, we'll have in phase or equibiaxial type of specimen. But it has been shown that we could even achieve um, uh, biaxiality ratios which are non-unitary through this equation or this one which is basically equivalent to the other one. Um, so these are examples of uh, simulations that we have obtained. The interesting aspect about it is that we only need one a single actuator and the same actuator and horn can be used to obtain the different stress levels at the center of the specimen um, um, which is only dependent in this case from the design of the specimen. This is displacement, what, what we are representing, uh, obviously. And we have here equibiaxial, pure shear, and then we have here two random scenarios um, of stresses. So basically, uh, this case here could be something like that. You could plot on a principal axis type of stresses. That's the change we would get. So in terms of the design principles of uh, cruciform specimens for very high cycle fatigue, um, this is all data that has been uh, published before. The first attempts were to use basically a scale factor 
we obtained from, so we picked up the, the specimens from Batiste et al. They were optimized specimens to ensure that we eliminate or reduce stress concentration factors and, and that we have maximum stress at the center. Um, we used the uh, scale factor to calibrate, to tune the specimen to vibrate at 20 kilohertz. That's pretty much the standard uh, frequency for two main reasons. It's the hearing uh, limit and the other one, it allows a lot of flexibility in terms of the, of the size of the specimen. So if the frequency would be a lot higher, specimens would tend to become smaller in size. The next uh, published work about this is about attempting a different approach, which is considering, this is an approximation, this is more about a mindset or, or thinking, a way of thinking about the specimen's design. We can think about it. Uh, I don't know why this screen can't see. There, there was here a fainted picture around, but um, it's thinking that we have something like here, this is massless, there is no mass, it's only stiffness. Here it's the opposite. So that's the model we've got here. So we know that the natural frequency, the first natural frequency is given by this equation. So it's clear to see that if I cut here a little bit, then M decreases, so the frequency goes up and vice versa. So I can tune the specimens by changing here these shapes. Uh, so using the same principles, we obtained non-unitary biaxiality ratio specimens. And the nice or the interesting observation is that if I cut here a delta X, so I decrease here the mass. So if I decrease here the mass, the frequency goes up. Then I need to compensate here by increasing delta Y so that the frequency goes down again to the 20 kilohertz. So that's what I'm trying to, to look at. And I noticed that the biaxiality ratio between the delta X and delta Y is exactly the same biaxiality ratio I obtain in terms of the measured displacements if it would be um, vibrating. So that's simulated uh, data. So why is that important? Because we are measuring the displacements of the free tips of the specimens with a laser um, measurement device that measures how much this, um, this moves. So um, there are issues though, and uh, Pedro uh, has, has uh, did, did quite a lot of studies about this. So the CT compression tension specimens we have, we have good results, maximum temperature there at the center, so illustrates maximum stress. We have the crack here at 45 degrees, as you can see, as expected if they are uh, same stresses in the two orthogonal directions. However, for the tension tension specimens or the equibiaxial specimens, we had some issues. And uh, what was found out is that we have here, you can't see it here very well, but there is there uh, a peak and the, 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 these arms here, instead of being shaking like this, they are also doing, I'm just going to focus on the picture on the right, that type of motion. So we are having there a, a mode shape that is affecting my results considerably. So it's, we call it a flapping mode shape, which is basically um, a flexural mode shape or bending. So just to illustrate again the reasoning behind, and if we take in mind what is a frequency response function, this is the equation for a receptance, and this is, um, again, very theoretical. This is just to explain the effects. If we consider a real system, we have infinite mode shapes. However, if we consider that we have only three mode shapes, uh, this is the equation we've got. So this is simulated data, a hypothetical data. The mode shape that was observed, flapping mode shape, the first one was at 19.8 kilohertz. And if we have another mode shape at 20 kilohertz, what we can see is that we have a contribute from three mode shapes, which so we are here, which is we have the blue one, which is practically zero, that mode shape, which is far away. It could be torsion, could be something else. We have the contribute from the gray line, which is here, plus the orange one. All these are eigenvectors, or, uh, by the way. So, so that's the orange one, that's the one I want. Uh, but the sum is that big. So we are actually seeing, even if I'm exciting the specimen at 20 kilohertz, just in a harmonic signal, I am actually seeing this mode shape that is from 19.8 kilohertz. I can't run away from that because I have this plus that plus that. That's the, the equation over there. So what, what we, we, we want to do is to, and that's what the, 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 the paper is about, we want to move this frequency away. We want to get rid of it either to the left or to the right. Here in the example I have, trying to move it to the right. If I move it to 21.5 kilohertz, then here the effect 
is a lot lower, and you can see that the black one, which is the sun, approaches the orange one a lot better. So the farther away, the best. So how can we do that? So, um, and that's what I'm presenting in this paper. That's the novelty of the paper. Again, using the same line of thought as um, for the design of the non-unitary biaxiality ratio specimens. We think about here, this is axial mode shape. This is bending mode shape, massless beam with a mass at the tip. And these are the equations for the first natural frequency. And what we can see is that if we would change the length or the distance of the mass to the center of the specimen, if we imagine the specimen is three of these links together, or four, sorry, if we reduce the distance, L, we can see that the axial mode shape is affected a lot, a lot less than the bending one because we have that a power of three. So what we want to do is to do that and then retune the specimen using the techniques we use. So these are results we've got. This is experimental. The others, this is ongoing work, as I said, are still FEA. COVID uh, is also a reason why. So we produced these specimens but weren't able to test them yet. So we got an improvement overall from the first specimens to the second ones to the thirds of 9.5% in terms of the flapping mode shape. So it was at 19.8 kilohertz, quite close to 20 kilohertz, 1% well smaller. And now it is at 21.9, which is farther away from what we want, at least from an FEA point of view. So what we did basically was to, so this is already published, but from here to here, what we did was to basically add there, and, and we ran optimization process to uh, attach there or, or manufacture the specimens using here over tips. So by increasing the thickness here of the specimen, we can reduce the length. So we can bring that mass inwards. So the flexural frequency of that mode shape will go up. Then we need to retune the specimen to get the axial down again. But because we have one is, is dependent on square root of L and the other one is dependent on L to the power of three divided by two, we, you get the idea, I think. So, um, right. This here is a little bit dangerous, what I'm going to talk about, but I have this in the abstract. I haven't developed much about this, but here we go. So, um, I'm going to, I'll try to be quick, but while we were doing all these simulations, we noticed that we were getting something interesting, and that was, that happened with the non-unitary biaxiality ratio specimens, is that we noticed that the biaxiality ratio of stress was not equal to the biaxiality ratio of strain, which wasn't necessarily equal to the biaxiality ratio of the displacements. For equibiaxial and pure shear uh, specimens, that's true. We get exactly the same, B sigma equals to BD equals to B uh, uh, strain. So we were getting that. But on non-unitary ones, we, we weren't. And I, I have to say, I still don't know very well why, but I, I went back to first principles. And, um, and what we realized was that these are loads of results we've got here. For the out-of-phase specimens, what I call the CT, uh, we got uh, some interesting results. The product between these two is equal to um, um, the backside to ratio of the displacements and the, the cuts that we do. Um, on the tensile uh, specimens, the biaxial ones, we had some issues, and I'm just trying to focus here on the issue. I could develop about that. I know the time is very short. What we ob observed was that we have issues, for example, when I have... Um, by axiality ratio of 0 0.4, um, what I notice is that actually I no longer have tension in one of the directions, which is what I wanted to have. I'm getting compression. That's what it, that is showing over there in the micro strains. So uh, here you, we can see basically what we got for, for the um, out of phase specimens. We can see, first of all, maximum stress no longer is at the center. It's happening here on the arms. Um, and then we can see in terms of the displacement, if we look to the overall specimen, we have the displacements as expected, but at the center, it inverts, as you, uh, as you can see, um, which is not um, an ideal situation. So that was an expected um, originally. And as I, as I said, I don't know the, the very well some of the answers uh, because this is all very observed very recently. One uh, minute uh, okay, to finish, I'm, I'm, I'm finishing. So, um, 
best uh, we could do is to write this equation, which is uh, uh, for the uh, TT specimens is equal to this. For the city, it is not. Um, one of the problems we've got here just to finalize is that as we decrease the non unitary bioxidative ratio, we are approaching the specimen to behave like a uniaxial specimen, meaning that we are constraining the motion in this direction. So if I have a uniaxial specimen, we will know the Poisson's effect. It will have a strain that is going inwards if it is non oxetic material. But because this arm is trying to move on the other direction, it's like having here some boundary conditions. Um, so just for conclusions on and future work, um, this type of uh, testing is very versatile because we can get many different types of uh, stress uh, ratios and there is also tension and torsion uh, published uh, as well uh, by uh, Costa and Reis and Freitas. Um, but there are many challenges we have still to overcome, especially in case of the in-phase specimens and the flapping mode shape we need to, to do some experimental testing, although the um, uh, simulations do show promising um, um, results. And um, just to uh, finalize in terms of future work, so I, have, I've, I started 3D printing as well, uh, these specimens for, for testing because it is a lot easier to obtain uh, the shape if we, if we 3D pin, print, um, and now it's time to, to test them. But I don't have any results of them being tested in uniaxial fatigue. So this is all very recent. Um, and uh, that's it, basically. So thank you very much. I don't know if uh, you have any questions. I rushed it a bit because I know I can speak forever.